that we may be reconciled to God. It is necessary for us to be convinced that we are enemies to God, that our state is dangerous, but yet that God is appeasable, that there is a mediator by whom the soul may come to God, that we must also seek God and his favor in Christ and seek him with confession of and mourning for sin. The particular passages which a true and sincere reconcilement requires are either such as prepare the heart to be willing to be reconciled, or such in which the substance or nature of reconciliation itself, or wherein the frame of the heart reconciled consists. For the preparing of us to be reconciled, it is necessary that we be convinced that we are enemies to God, and that he accounts us such, and that so long as we remain in that state, he is also an enemy to us, and can be no other. This, what God in Christ has done, gives demonstration. He would not save us upon Christ's bare entreaty, but he would have satisfaction and have Christ feel what it was to stand in the room of sinners. Yea, one end why God saved us by way of satisfaction to his justice was that sinners pardon might, in what Christ suffered, see and thoroughly apprehend what sin deserved. And it is not then requisite that they should at least lay to heart and be sensible of their own treasons and rebellions, and that God and they are at odds. Traitors must be convicted and condemned ere they are capable of a legal pardon, as sentence must be pronounced ere a legal appeal can be made. It is so in man's courts, and it is so in God's proceedings also. Neither indeed will men be brought to sue out for a favor and prize his love till then, for it was never heard any man did heartily sue to one for pardon and peace, with whom he did not first apprehend himself at variance. Number 2. It is necessary also that men apprehend the danger of going on in this state. For though one should know another and himself to be enemies, if he thought his enemy was either careless or weak, he would slight reconciliation with him, and though sought too, would not seek it. He who is mentioned in Luke fourteen thirty one and 32 sat down and considered if he were able to go out and meet his enemy, else he would never have sought conditions of peace. So the soul, until it apprehends and considers, finding God in itself enemies, what a sore enemy he is, and what a fearful thing it is to follow into his hands, Hebrews ten thirty 30 and 31, will not till then care to seek out to him. Number three, if one apprehended God implacable, not inclinable to peace, or hard to be entreated, he would never come at him either. So David, when Saul and he were at odds, suborned Jonathan secretly to observe what mind Saul bare towards him, First Samuel 20. And when at the 33rd verse he found him bent to kill him, David came not to him. So the Jews came away from God as a wild ass from its owner, Jeremiah 2, because there was no hope. Number four. The soul comes to be persuaded better things of God and things that accompany reconciliation and conceives hope that reconciliation is to be had and had for him. And therefore in all whom God means to reconcile to himself, after he has humbled them, he fixes a secret persuasion on their hearts that he is ready to be reconciled to them if they will be reconciled to him. God gives them a secret hint of his intended goodwill to them. He reveals what a gracious God he is and how freely he pardons. And because that all acquaintances begin with knowledge and is the ground of it, therefore God, when he brings any into this covenant, the first thing he does is teaches them to know him, Jeremiah thirty one thirty four, and gives them a new spirit, that they may be able to know him after another manner than ever before. He teaches them to know him, especially in his mercy, and those vast thoughts of mercy laid up in him, Jeremiah nine twenty four, to know him, to be a God that ever has loving kindness in the earth though not in hell to devils, yet in earth to men, and that therein he delights. He enables him also to see what happiness is to be had in communion with him, by reason of those glorious excellencies which are in him, 
and make such representations of himself to the soul as allures the heart. Hosea 2 verse 14. God draws the heart. John 6.44 For in the 45th verse it follows, They shall all be taught of God. Referring to these places of Isaiah and Jeremiah. For, says Christ, it is written in the prophets, They shall be taught of God. And the lesson is, as has been said, to know God. And God does this in a peculiar manner, working another kind of knowledge of himself than a man had before, or than any other men have. For it is a knowledge that enamors their hearts with him and allures them with his good will. And Christ says, Every man that has thus heard and learned comes to God. Though all hear the same message of reconciliation, yet God whispers something to a man's heart that he does not to every man. The same God, whom from everlasting spake to his Son and wooed him for us, speaks likewise secretly to a man's heart to allure and woo him to come to him. Number 5. And yet, fifthly, if the soul should look upon God alone as he is in himself, a God just, as well as merciful, he would by this be discouraged to come alone into his presence who is a consuming fire. The glory of God's justice would dash him and confound him. And as Adam trembled, so would he and could do no otherwise. It is the instinct of nature witness the heathen sacrifices and lesser gods as mediators to the great God, to seek out a daysman, Job 9.33. Yea, it is a way of man seeking friendship with another to use the mediation of some other that is great with him that is wronged. Therefore God teaches such a one to whom he means to be reconciled to know his son also, whom he has sent as his beloved son, and whom he is well pleased with others too. God holds and sets forth him as a propitiation, that in his blood he may both be just and the justifier of us. Romans 3.25 And he causes his glory to shine and appear in the face of Jesus Christ, and secretly points and directs the heart with an instinct to go to Christ. Every man that has heard and learned of the Father comes to me. John 6.45 as the beasts were taught to go to the ark. And we thus come into Christ by faith, and taking hold of him by the hand, Christ then leads us by the hand to God, Ephesians 3.18. We have this conduct and entrance and access to God, having such a person with us, and his interest in God to plead for us, and whose blood and satisfaction we may plead, We have free liberty of speech to plead his righteousness and satisfaction, and that with bare-facedness and boldness, as the word signifies, not to stand as condemned prisoners with our faces covered, but as persons acquitted in Christ, pleading pardon and confidence. And this is necessary, for as God intended to show us no favor without satisfaction, So no more can we apprehend that his favor, but in and through Christ's alone satisfaction, Romans 3.25. God has therefore set forth Christ a propitiation by faith in his blood, that he might be both just and a justifier of him that believes in Jesus, and how God should be just and a justifier of a sinner. No man could ever apprehend till he bottoms his faith on Christ's righteousness alone, which only can stand before justice and break through it to God. 6. And yet, sixthly, when all this is done, a man must be set at work to seek as a condemned man, God in his favor in Christ, and peace and reconciliation through him for life. Job 33, verse 24, He shall pray to him, and he will be gracious and say, Deliver him, I have found a ransom. God himself first sought to Christ and sought him with all earnestness and vehemency to become a mediator to him for us. And therefore, reason it is that he should stand upon it to be sought to, ere we obtain peace with him. And though his own son has performed it, and he covenanted with him that he should see his seed, yet God expected that his son should seek to him for the acceptation of his mediation, who yet has merited it, and who undertook it at his request. 
Therefore you see what a long prayer he puts up in John 17, though he says at the fourth and ninth verses, he had finished the work he gave him to do, yet he prays for the persons redeemed, and the acceptation of the redemptive work wrought throughout that chapter. God has told him in Psalm 2, verse 28, he must ask the heathen for his inheritance. And though they were his inheritance, as was his son, in whom besides he had purchased and bought with his blood, yet he must ask them. Yea, that glory, which was his own before the world was, he seeks to his father for, verse 5. And if it were thus between God and the Son in the business of reconciliation for us, and that in what he might challenge as his own, then surely much more it must be so between God and us, whom this reconciliation most concerns. He therefore pours upon a man a spirit of grace and supplication, Zechariah 12.10, that is, a spirit to supplicate for grace. And the same is evident from the nature of the thing itself. God is a party superior, and it is fit the inferior should seek to the superior. And also he is a person wronged, and though he be willing and desires to be reconciled more than ever, yet he will have his favor prized. David longed to be reconciled to Absalom, yet he would be sought unto, for he would have his favor prized to the utmost and not cast away. Yea, and to be in favor with God, being better than life, God will be sought to with more earnestness, contention, and constancy than a condemned man seeks for life. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. They shall find me when they seek and search for me with their whole heart. And Matthew eleven twelve, The violent take it by force. Though God be most willing to part with this great blessing, yet that it may be prized and sought, Indeed, he does as, as it were, hold it fast in his hand, and will have it wrung from him by force, as it were, Matthew eleven twelve. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And in Luke 13, verse 24, strive, he says, for many seek. The word in the original signifies an eager, violent contention and wrestling of mind. And there is reason from what God did in Christ for us, for this also. For how earnestly did God seek to his Son for us? He expressed all the earnestness that might be, laying his command upon him, and he added an oath to it, and so on. And does he not expect earnestness at our hands? Yea, how did Christ also in the days of his flesh put up an atonement, seeking to his Father with strong cries and tears? And shall we think to be heard with dull and faint cries? Nay, look, as God himself was more earnest in this manner of reconciling us than ever in anything else, so he will have us seek to him with more earnestness and contention than ever we sought anything, even life itself. And surely if God has bidden us seek peace with men, yea, and to ensue it, as in Psalm 34, verse 14, and 1 Peter 3, verse 11, that is, though it fly away, yet to follow it, much more are we then to seek peace with God himself. And though he seem to reject us, yet to follow him, and press upon him, as it were, from one room to another, that is, from one performance to another, and so to follow hard after him, as David says. My soul follows hard after thee. Thy right hand upholds me. Number seven. He will be sought to with confession of and mourning for offending him, for being in bitterness, Zechariah 12.10, and mourning, is joined with supplication for grace. And this is necessary to reconciliation, because an acknowledgment is to be made, Jeremiah 2 verse 13. God would be sought humbly to by us as those that are traitors and rebels. And God will have men know when he pardons that he knows what he pardons, and therefore will have them acknowledge what they deserve, that every mouth might be stopped and become guilty and obnoxious to their own acknowledgment before him. Romans 3 verse 19. As if a man will become wise, he must become a fool. 
So a man that will become a friend to God must turn enemy against himself and judge himself worthy of destruction. And God will have the freeness and glory of his grace acknowledged in pardoning, and therefore will have us confess our evil ways and deservedness of destruction. In the 36th of Ezekiel, when at the 31st verse he says, that when he pardoned them, they should remember their evil ways and acknowledge themselves worthy to be destroyed. The reason follows in the next verse. Be it known to you, I pardon it not for your sakes. I do it freely, and that you may know so much. Remember your evil ways. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways. And there's good reason also that mourning should be joined to all this from what God did in Christ when he reconciled us to himself, number one. For first, was not Christ, who never knew the pleasure of sin, put to grief? Yea, all the sorrow and smart was his, Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. He was a man of sorrow, and so on. Which sorrows were put upon him by his father also, verse 10. He put him to grief, and therein indeed put himself to grief. And if they both were thus put to grief and afflicted for our reconciliation and peace, then surely the least that we who have tasted of and enjoyed the pleasures of sin can do is to grieve also for that thing which made both father and son to grieve. God required of Christ to bear our sorrows. Now the sorrows of death and of his wrath God exacts not of you, but the sorrows of a friend, the sorrow of kindness, which causes not death as other sorrows do, but peace and joy in the very performance of it. Repentance never to be repented of. He requires you only to mourn kindly for your sins that pierced him, and such a mourning the nature of reconciliation requires. For secondly, where mourning for offending God is lacking, there is no sign of any good will yet worked in the heart to God, nor of love to him, without which God will never accept a man. For the least thing in which good will towards a friend whom we have injured can be shown is to mourn and be sorry for it, as the least requital for a kindness is to be thankful. And this all that have affections in them do when they can in no way else make amends. Number three else there is no hope of amendment. God will not pardon till he sees hopes of amendment. Now until a man confesses sin, and with bitterness it is a sign he still loves it, Job 20, verses 12 to 14. While he hides it, spares it, and doesn't forsake it, it is sweet in his mouth. And therefore till he confesses it and mourns for it, it is a sign it is not bitter to him, and so he will not forsake it. A man will never leave sin till he finds bitterness in it, and if so, then he will be in bitterness for it, Zechariah 12.10. And a godly sorrow works repentance, Second Corinthians 